Hello everyone, John Adorney here. And this is a video about the making of my third album, Waiting for the Moon. And uh, it was uh, done in 2004. And I'm just gonna play some of the little segments from some of the tracks and give you a little bit of the background about how the album came about. So the first thing is that this was a very unique album. The first two albums that I did, Beckoning and The Other Shore, which I've also done these videos for, they were primarily videos, I mean, uh, albums that were made from music that I had written previously up to that point. And when I came into this world of making albums, I got these tracks up to snuff and selected the ones that I thought fit best on those albums. Waiting for the Moon was very different because I actually set aside three or four months to just write the music for it and write and record all the music for it. Uh, so it was a really fun uh, project to work on. The music came out, just flowed very beautifully. And that's a luxury I haven't really had uh, since, is just to set aside three or four months just to write the music and to, uh, you know, produce the whole album uh, without any distraction or whatever. So uh, the, uh, the first piece on the album is called Always, and it's uh, kind of a typical John Adorney piece, at least up to that point, where it starts out as, starts out as an instrumental, and then I add some very simple words for Daya to sing. And, uh, but uh, I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed writing this piece and uh, it goes a little something like this. So uh, that was, I thought, a great track to start off, uh, start off the album with. And uh, then uh, the uh, next track, uh, The Potter's Gift, uh, has turned out to be one of my most popular tracks. And uh, it, was, it was quite an adventure putting it together. Uh, first of all, um, uh, it was just fun writing the melody. Uh, and also, uh, right at the beginning, you'll hear a beat that I heard at a, a Greek uh, party, where it was just like that classic Greek rhythm. And I thought, that's a really cool beat to do a track to. So I recorded that rhythm, and then I just started playing the music. And it came out, just really flowed very nicely. And uh, the, um, the chord sequence is a little reminiscent of uh, uh, Lorena McKennett's uh, The Bonnie Swans, but she and I just hear music in a similar way. That's my attitude. And uh, the, uh, uh, I'll just play a little bit of it, and then uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, later on what happens. <laughs> So uh, the piece kind of goes along and then there's a big a drum break and then an oboe part comes in. Uh, oboe was one of the instruments, I think the only instrument on this piece that I didn't play. Um, and, 
And then, then there's a completely different musical section at the end. And when I had recorded, uh, so I was playing the piano, the guitar, and the cello, but I hadn't recorded the cello part yet. And I was going to come into the studio that day to record the cello part. It was a big climactic moment of making this track. And that morning I got a really upsetting email from another musician who was just telling me how bad my music was and that his is much better. And well, this is really weird stuff. I was so mad. And I thought, oh, this is great. Now I've got to go into the studio and play this beautiful cello solo. this really soaring cello solo uh, with uh, this really bad feeling. But I just kind of put it aside and maybe it gave it a little extra oomph. But, uh, uh, but anyway, I, I recorded it. And, and one of the things that was really fun about uh, the end of this piece is having the cello, the cello, the guitar, and the piano all playing off each other like they're jamming. But I had played all three, so it was just kind of a cool, something that I always dreamed of from when I was a, a, a little kid of just being able to record things, all the parts myself, and being able to play, play the parts myself and play against them. So here's a little bit of that ending. Next piece on the uh, on the album is called "A Butterfly in the Well," and uh, this was a piece that Adaya is going to sing. So this is really the first track that uh, she is singing a real song, not just a word or a few words, um, kind of almost as an afterthought. Uh, and I remember writing the words to this piece and the music to it kind of every morning when I woke up like a little bit more would come come to me about what the words would be and uh, and it was beautiful um, uh, you know I, I love the way it came out it was very unique it was very different than anything else I had ever written and one of the amazing things about this whole album was that Daya had never heard the song before and she recorded, came into the studio one day and recorded this song, the, the title track, Waiting for the Moon, and the last track, uh, Mavo Mavo. She had never, he never heard any of them and she learned and sang them and recorded them all in one afternoon. I just thought that was amazing. That was really... That was just amazing. And she gave such great performances. So here's a little bit of uh, A Butterfly in the Well. And it goes like this. In a basket that breathes A garden grows And a flower with no stem Is blooming was not an easy song to learn. <laughs> the tonality of it was very unique and uh, Badaya did a wonderful job. Uh, the next track is a track called In Bloom and when I had put the tracks for the album together, I had the rough demo tracks, I invited Javier Sanz from Eversound over to play them for him to see what he thought and uh, when I played him in Bloom, before I played it to him, I said, I don't know if this piece is going to, I can't tell if this is a good piece or not. I don't know if it's going to really fit on the album. 
So I played it and afterwards he said, oh no, John, it's definitely good. You should put it on. So, uh, and it ended up being a pretty popular piece. So uh, this is a little bit of In Bloom. And one of the challenges of this piece was that I think there's, I was playing the cello four different parts on it. And it's a challenge to get the cello playing that densely and to really not have it sound too, you know, muddy or whatever. So uh, it was a challenge, but it, it came out very nice. And, and uh, here's a little bit of it. So that's in bloom. And uh, the next track is uh, called The River Secret. Um, I was going to call it uh, The River. And my four-year-old son said, Dad, that's not a good title. Call it The River Secret. So that's what it ended up being called. And my other son had also had a play, a played a part in it because I was... Um, recording, I was working on the piece and there's a drum part that's just kind of bubbling along during it on the keyboard, a, dr a keyboard drum sound. And I'm listening to to it and it sounds kind of weird. Like the drums are going boop, 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 boop. They're kind of going up and down. And I looked over and my son was moving the pitch wheel on my keyboard. I didn't know it. Uh, but as it was recording, that's what ended up on the recording. I thought that really sounds kind of good. So I left it on there. And also the, this piece and also the Potter's Gift uh, uses a, uh, an instrument that was loaned to me by a few friends that happened to be in L.A. at the time. Uh, and it, it was a Bulgarian tambura and kind of like a Greek bazooki. And it had a really cool sound. I was so happy to have that instrument. I used it on the Potter's Gift and on this track. And you'll hear it at the beginning. And, uh, and uh, it goes a little bit like this. <laughs> So another thing that's funny about this track is that if, in that introduction, you can't hear it that well, but, uh, you know, there's that whole little introduction. And then there's four tambourine hits, bump, bump, dump, dump, and then the piece starts. And when I was mastering the album, the engineer, Leslie Chu, he really laughed at that. He said, that is really funny because usually you would only do that if you're performing it live when the drummer hits one two, three, four. So to actually put that on the recording, you obviously don't need it, but I just thought, well, whatever. It makes it sound like a live recording anyway. So uh, the next piece is the title track, and this is also one of uh, my most, you know, played pieces, uh, Waiting for the Moon. And uh, it's a story, uh, it's funny because it's a story about this bird that's waiting for the moon to come out. And, and it's a cold night and, uh, uh, you know, just waiting in the dark for the moon to come out. And then the moon finally comes out and the moon bird starts to sing. And I remember when one of the reviews came out for the album, the reviewer said that it was uh, a, a, a bird waiting for its, the moon to come out so it would meet its mate, that its mate and, and, it, and it were going to meet under the moon. But... That wasn't the point of the of the song. The point of the song is the bird was waiting for the moon. The bird was in love with the moon. So uh, I just thought that was kind of funny. It was a, it was a good interpretation, but it wasn't exactly what uh, uh, what I had in mind. And I think the image comes from a Kabir poem, if I remember correctly. Anyway, I remember writing this song in my head as I was driving uh, on the freeway, 
And I really saw it as this kind of a phrase and then a, a gap, a phrase and a gap, and then the chorus. And then I had a vision of uh, this pause and then the moon starts to come out and it, the music would slowly start to build. And I had actually had a completely different vision of it. I had envisioned it more like the gypsy dance from Riverdance. Uh, is it Riverdance? Or Lord of the Dance? One of those, you know, Ronan Hardiman uh, pieces where it just becomes this you know, exotic dance. But that's not how it turned out. It turned out to be like a three and a half minute electric guitar solo, which really, I mean, is came out pretty cool. And, uh, and it was really able to build. And um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's fun to listen to. And Daya did a great job singing it. Uh, I remember her being in the vocal booth and I was kind of coaching her on how to get into it in terms of telling the story. And it was really great watching her sing it and sing it with so much feeling. Uh, so, uh, which is one of the things I always loved about singing, having Daya sing on my albums, is she gets whatever the piece is about. She just gets it. I don't need to explain anything to her or anything. So, uh, so here's a little bit of Waiting for the Moon. The moon bird waits Sitting unaware Cold winds that blow And when at last they meet All across the night Can be heard the sweet sound Of the moon bird's song Waiting for the moon to show driving to the studio to record the song and I didn't have that last line and I was getting a little panicked it's like Johnny you better come up with that line fast because you're going to be teaching it to Daya in an hour uh, so I right at the last minute before I got off the exit that line came me uh, to the bird who sits waiting in the dark below um, and you, you know one of the things I always love about that is when the uh uh, when the when she says the phrase uh, the cold winds that blow she really does it like a like shiver like it really is cold and just saying it's so, with so much feeling it was really gorgeous and then there's the guitar solo uh, which is a big part of it and uh, I had a friend who led some guided imagery groups and she wanted a recording of just the guitar solo she used that to end all of her sessions just people to just take the journey that this guitar solo takes. So, uh... bit of Daya's singing at the end there and she when she heard it she said didn't you want to make my voice a little bit louder there and I, maybe I should have but anyway it came out came out nice so uh, the next piece is called uh, Unbroken and this is a piece that uh, also started with a beat I was looking out my window uh, here at my house one day and uh, a car drove down the street. I had the window closed and their car drove down with its windows closed, all tinted windows and everything. And all, all I could hear was uh, the beat, the bass and the beat of this boom, ba boom, 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 ba boom, boom. So I thought I got to write a piece with that beat. I mean, it's a pretty common hip hop beat. And actually that 
song for what it's worth by the buffalo springfield uses that beat i think that was the first time uh hip-hop that kind of a hip-hop beat had been used in, in a popular song on the radio um it, let me know if if i'm not right but that was the first time i ever heard that beat so uh this is uh a little bit of unbroken smooth easy piece to work on it was just really just so enjoyable uh, the next piece is called uh, flow of love uh, this was actually I think the one piece on the album that I had written earlier and uh, I just really thought it would be a, a really good contribution to the album and I hear this piece a lot because my wife has it as her alarm sound in the morning so every morning I hear, hear a little bit of uh, flow of love a pretty pleasant piece to wake up to. Uh, the next piece is called The Dance. And uh, this has uh, one of my favorite instruments is the oboe. Uh, and I don't play it, so I hire an oboe player to play. And he also played the flute, uh, the flute part on it as well. Oh, actually, no, a different uh, Richard Hardy played the flute part on this, this track. And uh, Shin Jameson, my go-to oboe player, play the oboe part. So, um, so here's a little bit of the dance. That just reminds me of how fun it was to write this music. It just all came out so smoothly. It was really just a pleasure to, to play it all. The last piece on the album is called Mavo Mavo, which uh, is the African language of Gun. Uh, my friend uh, Marcel Ajibi, who sings on many of my albums, uh, came up, I, I gave him some phrases and he was telling me how they would be spoken in his language. And uh, uh, from he's from Benin. And uh, Mavo Mavo, I thought would fit perfectly. And the whole translation means, I love you from eternity to eternity, which I just thought was a beautiful message. So here's a little bit of Mavo Mavo. And I think this was the only time, even though a lot of tracks that I've done have Daya and Marcel both singing on it, I think this was the only time they were actually in the studio at the same time. Even though Marcel wasn't singing, he was present so that he could coach Daya on how to pronounce the, the, uh, the words. So uh, that was a fun session, having them both there. So here's a little bit of Mavo Mavo. Mm -hmm. 
She has such a great voice and such a beautiful heart. Uh, and the other thing is that the chorus of that song, the Mavo Mavo part, actually was from a piece that I had written earlier, just that end chorus part, or just that chorus part. And then I later, later on put it on an album. It's called uh, At Home. And... Uh, if you listen to at home and then listen to the uh, that chorus of mavo mavo you'll you'll see that it's the same you can hear the piano part the uh, of at home under her her singing mavo mavo here's a little bit of at home much slower you can hear that it's much slower but that does happen sometimes where I'll I'll write a piece instrumentally and then have Daya sing on it but sometimes it's it's I wish people could hear what it sounded like what it sounds like under the singing because the piece was a complete piece of music underneath the singing before the singing was added onto it usually so uh so anyway, that's an example. If anybody's interested, they can go check that out. So that's a little bit of uh, uh, waiting for the moon. I was going through some some of my papers a few months ago, and I I found this this you know award that I had completely forgotten that waiting for the moon was nominated for a best contemporary instrumental album in uh, 2004. I didn't win, but it got nominated by the new age reporter .com. So anyway, but it's always been one of my favorite albums. It was so enjoyable to work on. And uh, I know that a lot of people really have enjoyed this album. So uh, that's uh, all I have to say right now about the making of uh, Waiting for the Moon. If anybody has any questions, you can always feel free to write to me through johnadorney.com. Ask me any questions you have. Uh, I love hearing hearing from you. So anyway, be well and uh, I'll see you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.